immediately became the Pantheon's most distinctive feature. The oculus, a 30-foot wide hole in the center of the ceiling. The oculus eliminates the stress of heavy concrete at the dome's weakest point, and it lights up the interior like the sun does the earth. Imagine as a ancient, uh, never having been in this kind of interior space before, because no, no other interior space had ever looked like it before, uh, feeling um, the religious aspect of the interior itself, um, a building which was dedicated to all the gods. The Pantheon's engineers strove for perfection and almost achieved it. But there is one mysterious flaw in the design that still baffles modern observers. The Pantheon's front portico, the colonnaded gateway to the interior, is about 10 feet too short. It doesn't connect with the rotunda where it should. Why 50-foot columns were not used instead of the 40s that were there can only be held to speculation at this point. Did they sink in the Mediterranean? Um, were the Romans not able to acquire the stone to achieve uh, those kind of columns in the time necessary for Hadrian to inaugurate the building? We can't say for sure. For centuries, the Pantheon has stood as a confounding engineering enigma. But the way it was built is just part of the puzzle. The bigger mystery is who designed it. There are no surviving records to reveal the architect's identity. But modern speculation centers on Emperor Hadrian himself. He was a very versatile individual and painted and wrote poetry and, and loved architecture. So many of Hadrian's other buildings were domes. So it seems to me that Hadrian may have had a hand in the design. Another potential candidate is Apollodorus of Damascus, the genius behind the forum built by Hadrian's predecessor, Trajan. Apollodorus was skeptical of Hadrian's architectural skills and bold enough to declare it publicly. Apollodorus at one point sneers at Hadrian and says, go off and design your pumpkin domes. After a certain point, Hadrian just gets so upset with Apollodorus because Apollodorus um, criticized Hadrian's designs that he had him commit suicide. In 138 AD, eight years after ordering the death of Rome's greatest architect, Hadrian himself died of natural causes at the age of 62. His two decades in power had been one of the most prolific periods of construction in Roman history. By the time of his death, harbors, temples, bridges, and basilicas in every corner of the empire bore his name. It would be nearly a century before another emperor would commission one of Rome's last great engineering achievements and send the empire spiraling towards self-destruction. In the decades following Hadrian's death, the Roman Empire remained the dominant force in Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. Its emperors maintained absolute authority. Its armies remained invincible. And its architects continued to inspire jaw-dropping awe. Their crowning achievement, a behemoth complex of Roman baths, was commissioned in 212 AD by a corrupt power monger named Caracalla. He rose to power the old-fashioned way, through murder. Caracalla's late father, Emperor Septimius Severus, had wanted his two sons to rule the Roman Empire together. But Caracalla and his brother Geta hated each other. After their father's death, it was only a matter of time before one eliminated the other. Caracalla struck first. 
Caracalla had him killed right in front of his mother, which seems to me a horrible, horrible thing. Gaeta's name was erased from memory, not only from inscriptions, but Gaeta's image was chiseled out. They erase the name, but they leave the erasure. We know that the state has taken um, steps to eradicate him, and we should remember that lesson. During the reign of Caracalla, blood once again flowed through the imperial chambers and the empire was back in the hands of a tyrant who ruled by fear. The rule of Caracalla is characterized by that of a man, emperor, who places himself above man, within the sphere of the gods. Caracalla wanted to leave a legacy that would secure his fame for the ages. As the Colosseum had for Vespasian, the Forum for Trajan, and the Pantheon for Hadrian. He had to prove himself as worthy of the imperial power. He had to show that he was even better than his father. The new emperor would attempt to cleanse his past sins by building a bath complex. For centuries, baths had been an integral part of daily life in Rome. They centered around an arrangement of hot and cold pools. But the baths were more than just a place to bathe. They were country clubs open to people of every class. After you finish work, you're going to go to the baths for a couple of hours to unwind, to listen to politics, to, to get a rub down, to have a manicure, to have a haircut. There were places to work out. You could wrestle. And then, of course, you could go to the baths themselves and go to the hot rooms, sweat a lot. And you were surrounded by magnificent structures that were sheathed in marble and decorated with statues. And they were for the benefit of the average person. This was not just a structure for the rich. This was for the average Roman citizen. Baths had always been a popular construction project among Roman emperors. Previous rulers like Nero, Titus, and Trajan had each built extravagant baths in their own name. And Caracalla was determined to trump them all with the most massive bath complex ever built. The imposing shell that remains today is a testament to his success. As you can see from what remains all around us, there was a series of giant rooms in which there were swimming pools the size of Olympic pools. There were bathing pools at different temperatures, private bathing rooms, and areas where people could mix and mingle. The central building was larger than St. Peter's Basilica, and trimmed from stem to stern in gold and marble. Its floors were covered with intricate mosaics, fragments of which still remain. Surrounding the main building were open spaces for track and field events, separate buildings containing libraries, shops, restaurants, and even brothels lined the perimeter. The complex could comfortably accommodate nearly 2,000 Romans at a time. This small town would have been heaving with people every day. These enormous rooms are a testament to the engineering and skill of the people who built it. They surpassed any of the baths that had been built previously. Caracalla's laborers worked overtime to complete his baths quickly. To build such a magnificent bathing facility in five years, there would have been between five and 10,000 people working daily for five years straight. The buildings seen above ground were just half of the story. Beneath the complex, a water channel tunneled from a nearby aqueduct diverted five million gallons of fresh water into the baths every day. Water for the hot pools was diverted to furnaces where it was heated over wood fires. As many as 50 such furnaces were built directly beneath the floor. 
this floor literally divided the world of the wealthy and successful Roman citizen from the underworld of slaves and laborers who were toiling away in furnace-like conditions, stoking fires and, and choked with smoke and fumes and, and so on. Up here in these beautifully decorated chambers with marbles and mosaics and uh, decorated tiled ceilings, it must have seemed like paradise. The Baths of Caracalla opened in 216 AD. They were one of the last great feats of Roman engineering, combining all the skills the Romans had perfected over the centuries. In a bath complex like that of Caracalla, a lot of great achievements of Roman engineering come together. The production of bricks, masonry, the import of marble, you have the long tradition that the Romans have in building water systems, aqueducts, but also drainage and sewer systems. You have also their long experience in the use of concrete, which allows them to create big spaces that they can cover with vast spanning domes and vaults. Caracalla's baths were an amazing success but the same couldn't be said for his reign. While his pet project strained the Roman economy, Caracalla hemorrhaged more cash on costly invasions of Parthia and Armenia, eastern regions not controlled by a Roman emperor since Trajan a century earlier. Like Trajan, Caracalla had hoped to cement his legacy through conquest. Instead, he sealed his own fate. In 217 AD, after a six-year reign of cruelty and intimidation, Caracalla was stabbed to death by his own guards during an Eastern military campaign. That same year, a devastating fire gutted the Colosseum and the soul of the capital. The amphitheater would be rebuilt 20 years later, but the empire itself would never recover. The glory days of Augustus, Vespasian, and Trajan were long gone, and they would never return. Over the next three centuries, the empire that had once burned so brightly slowly burned out. The theories as to why fill volumes. Some people say it is the metallurgy that poisoned them. Some people say it is the decadence and the inbreeding in the upper class. Some people say it is the lack of a trained army and subsequently no defense. I think the Roman Empire was simply too large to be governed effectively, to be administered, and to create any kind of real sense of community. In the 5th and 6th centuries, Germanic warrior tribes repeatedly sacked Rome, demanding land and money. In 537, an invading tribe went right for the jugular, destroying the city's most vital life-sustaining arteries, its aqueducts. Without the running water its citizens had come to rely on, the once great capital crumbled. People without water couldn't live in the city center. The gardens and farmlands could not be watered. The population of 1.2 million people quickly dwindled to 12,000. That's a 99% decrease. 1,500 years after the fall of Rome, its engineering legacy still inspires and confounds modern builders. So many of the things that the Romans uh, were able to do in their time, we were not able to do again until we developed new technologies. We wouldn't be able to accomplish a dome like the Pantheon without the use of a computer, certainly. We wouldn't be able to move a hillside without mechanized equipment. Given their tools, we would never be able to accomplish those same things. Maybe the most important lesson the Romans taught us is one that Julius Caesar, Nero, and Caracalla never understood. That the same blind ambition that drives our progress can also bring about our demise. These people lived out their ambitions and their kind of appetites in such a way that we both 
admire them and kind of abhor them at the same time.